Good evening, and a very warm welcome to all of you. I am Sister Barbara Reed, President of Catholic Theological Union and a Dominican Sister of Grand Rapids, Michigan. It is my very great pleasure to welcome you to this important conversation on religious life and the entire church engaging synodality. This evening's program is sponsored by CTU's Center for the Study of Consecrated Life. The center was founded at CTU in 2015 to serve as a theological, academic, and pastoral resource for engaging contemporary issues and realities in consecrated life today from a global perspective. CTU has a treasure trove of resources for the study of consecrated life with 24 men's religious communities who are the corporate owners of CTU and approximately 40 communi communities of women religious among our students, staff, and faculty. We hope you will join us often for conversations like these or to take a course. Please explore our website at ctu.edu for all our offerings. And now I would like to introduce to you Sister Maria Simperman, RSCJ, who is Associate Professor of Catholic Theological Ethics and Director of the Center for the Study of Consecrated Life at CTU. Maria? Welcome to our gathering this evening, Engaging Synodality and Consecrated Life in the Widest Church Imaginable. And we're so happy you're here, those of you who are online. Uh, welcome, we've had over 500 people register, so it's just a gift to be with you. All of you who are here in person and all of you who are part of the digital community, we had over 500 people registering for this gathering and sister natalie welcome as as well i will do a introduction of you in a in a moment but just to set a little bit of context here this is our second session engaging synodality and consecrated life and today we're particularly looking at the synodality and consecrated life within consecrated life engaging the wide church. And so it's wonderful that we have a wide church community among us. And that is a piece of the conversation for this evening. I also want to offer a note of thanks. Uh, this program was actually made possible through the generous sponsorship of the following congregations. The Congregation of Sisters of St. Agnes, the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration, the School Sisters of St. Francis, the Servants of Mary, the Cincinnati Dominican Sisters, the Sisters of St. Dominic in Racine, Wisconsin, and the Sisters of Mercy of the Holy Cross. So thank you very particularly for making this particular program possible and available. A note of further anticipation we hope you find this conversation interesting, informative, engaging. We, we think it will be. We hope it is for everyone. And we hope you'll have an interest in continuing the conversation. Because today is in some ways a part one that doesn't require you to do the next one, but we'd like to invite you to a second one that Natalie and I are blessed to be part of. And that is going to be this coming Thursday in partnership with the Global Sisters Report. Uh, they have uh, once a month or uh, once a quarter an online uh, webinar on a conversation. And they reached out to us and said to both of us, would you be willing to have a conversation? And we said, we're, we're having one at CTU. And they said, well then, we could do the, the follow-up of that because there's no end to conversation on synodality and opportunities. And so we're delighted to do this in partnership with them. Uh, if someone does not come to this, doesn't mean that they cannot be part of the second one, but uh, we'll, we hope the conversation will flow and that the comments we get from you uh, in the chats and uh, there are pens and paper on every chair here that the conversation that you also wish to engage uh, that we can hold in mind and move forward in, in further conversations. 
So what I'd like to do is to introduce now our conversation partner this evening. And I'm, I'm blessed to call Sister Natalie also a friend. And so it's uh, a conversation that we think is um, an invitation to all of us to have with one another, a synodal conversation in a particular way. So uh, Sister Natalie Baker is a, is a Catholic sister from France, a member of the Congregation of the Xaviers. She was appointed a consultant to the Synod of Bish Bishops in 2019 and named one of its undersecretaries in 2021. And yet before that, and she'll speak to this, uh, she, from 2008 to 2018, oversaw the National Service for the Evangelization of Young People and for Vocations within the Bishop's Conference of France. Uh, she's also an avid sailor and a deep student of the synodal process. Uh, and she has written on many topics related to religious life and now also synodality, and you can find those online. Uh, but we have a connection here at CTU, and we're just delighted about it because Natalie had her sabbatical here one spring, right? So if this has been a long winter for you, think of what the result could be, right? <laughs> that there's, there's a lot that goes with it, um, a lot of benefits and growth. And so uh, we think uh, this is just a delightful time to have you back at CTU and to share uh, what's been moving in the church and as you're seeing it also impacting religious life. So Sister Natalie, I'm just delighted to welcome you back to CTU. Thank you so much, uh, dear Maria, and thank you so much also Sister Barbara and all of you who are here in person but also online. It's uh, wonderful to be back to CTU. I have so good memories and I can really say that my sabbatical time here, here with the Hesburgh sabbatical program has been really a, a fruitful time and a time of transition. So I'm very, very grateful for what I have received here and uh, to have this opportunity to be with you uh, today here to share about synodality uh, is uh, really um, a gift for me also <laughs> because we are all together in Synod now since uh, October 9. So we are on the journey <laughs> and when I have to go in another place, I had a lot of travel this uh, month, it reminds me that this is the way to be church as pilgrims and uh, I'm happy to be there. Perfect, thank you. And uh, we love that Chicago is a pilgrimage site as well. <laughs> so. It's very powerful this moment, and I, I think of it when I have um, offered a few reflections on the synodal, the synodal moment we're in. I think of it as an act of hope. It's not an act of confidence or 50-50 chance things are going to move, but it's really deep theological hope mm -hmm. in this process and what the Spirit is inviting. And so it's a, a deep Spirit-filled journey, and yet we know also with Vatican II, that it didn't just begin when Vatican II began uh, formally, but there were many things that flowed into this moment. And just uh, the first part is simply here in our conversation to ask you to share a little bit about when you saw that synod and the synodal journey was going to be such a key moment. So it wasn't in October, but you shared at one point that you started seeing it even early on with your work in the Synod on Young People. Would you share a little of that evolution? Yes, maybe I can say that um, we began to speak about synodality, in fact, just after a very key speech of Pope Francis, maybe one of the most important of his pontificate. It was in the September uh, 17 in 2015 during the Synod on Family and it was a speech for the 50th anniversary of the institution of the Synod of Bishops. That is, uh, the Synod of Bishops has been created, in, instituted in 1965 at the end of the Council, Second Vatican Council, as a fruit of the Council, as a way to continue the experience of the Council. And after that, uh, you know, in 2018, there was a synod on young people. And so with my experience, 30 years of youth ministry, 10 years at the Bishops' Conference, at that time I was 
so director of this national office for youth and uh, vocation. And so we have been involved in the preparation of the Synod on Youth. And really, during the Synod on Young People, we have understood with all the Synodal Fathers who were there, the young observers, that the only way today to transmit the faith, to continue the mission of the church, is, a synodal, uh, is with a synodal style. And in his speech of, uh, I refer to the speech of Pope Francis, he really says that in the world of today, as we look at this world and now so divided with uh, a fragmented world, synodality is the path for the church of the third millennium. And after that, Pope Francis repeats that synodality is truly the call of God for the church today, the will of God. So I could say that I receive this call as, you know, uh, how the church has discerned her path, that now to continue the mission of the church, we have to um, foster this synodal style. But also looking back at uh, my 30 years of experience with young people in the campus ministry, uh, with the Ignatian Youth Network, and also um, uh, with this national office for youth evangelization, I can really say, and I have reflecting on this experience, I have seen that what is fruitful where young people uh, receive the gospel, you know, is the places, the projects where we are the church together, in which everybody is protagonist. The key for youth ministry, I have discovered and experience, is to have young people as co-leader, is to promote co-responsibility. And so I have discovered in a very experiential way also that this way of being church all together as protagonist uh, with this key word of participation, co-responsibility, is truly the way to be the church, especially with young people, but not only with young people, with uh, today we can mm -hmm. see that it is the way to be the church in this world, in fact. Mm. Absolutely, and we've talked about being a synodal church requires us to be a listening church mm. so that if we're walking on the way we're going to walk with each other and you can't have both speaking at the same time or, or no one listening <laughs> and so that's been a very powerful piece because with the synod on young people there were literally times in between the interventions the the conversations where there was silence where that was asked to just listen to what you've heard and I find that that's very much the call right now, too. And I think the stage that we're in with the synodal journey is that stage of the church listening and the church speaking to one another and, and going at that. And I remember I, when we first, the first year of the Center for the Study of Consecrated Life, we had an event in this very room where we had five different theologians speak for only five minutes, which is quite a task. Uh, on, on lofty topics like community and the option for the vulnerable and uh, interculturality. And then we invited people over a meal to talk to one another at the table of their choice and to offer what they're thinking about. And after about 15 minutes, we had silence. We rang a bell and had silence for five minutes so that people could really chew on what they heard. And then rang the bell again, and the conversation continued, and it was different. It was different because people thought about what they had heard. A and that same sense is what we're being invited to right now as a whole church, everyone, it, to be listening to one another and to have everyone participate in that. And so people who are part of the church at this moment, people who have been, and people who are not, and can offer a lens to what does church look like and, and what do you sense calling? So what we would like to do, we're gonna do this in three parts, is just invite you for a moment to think about where have you experienced that deep space of listening or being listened to? 
that deep space of being listened to or listening. For just one minute, we invite you to think about that. And now for two minutes, for those of you who are here in person, we invite you to turn to one person next to you and share that, so each having a minute. For those of you who are online, if you would take a minute and just write in one sentence, when was that? When was that? All right, we welcome you back. And we'd like to move then to the next space of, of looking at just when have we known that personally and that experience? And then how, have, how are we experiencing synodality, the, the call to us as a church? And what does that mean? And so, uh, Sister Natalie, you've talked about Vatican II and certainly Lumen Gentium naming the church as the people of God is, is so key in there. And, and we could see this in the Acts of the Apostles. And, and these are all, synodality is a way of walking together, right? And how we're, we can do this. And, and Pope Francis has talked about this is a process. This is going to be our way. This is our conversion, actually, to a synodal way. Um, how do you see this synodal process impacting and engaging us as church? This is a very large question, so it'll be in a variety of parts. But, but just to get us thinking, how, how do you see this from, from your lens of service uh, at, at the Vatican at this moment? Well, maybe the first thing I would like to share with you is... Uh, uh, um, for to do the synod, we have four commissions: a commission on theology, spirituality, methodology, and communication. And for the opening of the synod, so in Rome with Pope Francis, October nine and ten, and the week after in all the dioceses in the world. Just after that, uh, with all the theologians, we really had uh, a deep uh, conviction, and uh, I would. Quote, I would like to quote one of these theologians, but he's not the only one. Um, Pierre Okoda, who is the secretary of the International Commission, uh, Theological Commission, who says, you know, the first sentence of the preparatory document to, for the synod is, the whole church is convoked in synod. And in fact, it's the first time in all the history of the church that all the baptized <laughs> are convoked into a in, in a synod. So uh, Pierre Okoda and others uh, said, we are living the most important ecclesial historical event since Vatican II. And we are living that also as a fruit of Vatican II. Mm. Um, because synodality was truly the style of the early church in th and, and some often we refer to uh, chapter 15 of the Acts of the Apostle as the first synod, as the kind of paradigm model mm -hmm. for the synod. But in the early church, when there were some question, issues, division, conflicts, what do you do? They meet, they discuss together, they pray, they discern, and uh, then uh, there is a decision. So the governance of the church was collegial and synodal in the early church with a great sense that the church was first the communion, the community. And one of the first image for the church that I like very much is the church as a boat with this idea that, uh, you know, we are to all together um, in, the in, in a boat. So, then, for many reasons, the history uh, put the emphasis on, the, on a vision of the church more in an institutional, juridic, juridical approach of the church as a perfect society. But then, with Vatican II, we can say the light and the first focus was um, through the process of adjournamento to retrieve <laughs> uh, what uh, the style of the early church, the light was put uh, on the baptism. First, we are all uh, baptized before our, our difference of vocations, of position. And 
So to be a synodal church is truly to retrieve this sense that first we are an ecclesial we, we are a community. And I like very much the logo of the synod you may have in mind, where you see uh, uh, some kids, uh, little kids in front of uh, these people who are working together. You have uh, an old person, you, you have a bishop, you have a sister, a priest, you have many lay people in different colors. But the main protagonist is a big <laughs> Holy Spirit because it's truly to be the church with this image that we are missionary pilgrims all together. We are a people and in fact synodality is a process that built us as people of God. And um, so it's first a view and a vision of the church that is more horizontal it's not to get rid of the hierarchical principle that is also part of the nature of the church, but we have such during many years, and we still have in our mind in many places, a mindset to look at the church first as a pyramid. And this synod is really to help us to um, feel that we are together one people, we are called to be one people, and not only uh, people as God as baptized, but we can say there are two perspectives when you speak about synodality. The first one is how we are the church at intra, but it goes uh, with a way to be the church among the people in the world with this style of dialogue that the joys, the hopes, the griefs of uh, the people are ours. And so we always have to think about a synodal church as, uh, you know, synodality is always a missionary synodality. So it's not only a way to be all together uh, as people of God, as pilgrims journeying together, but it's also about uh, journeying together with all the people of the earth. Uh, so it's really how, because the, as Pope Francis say, the concept of synodality is rather easy to catch up, even if it's not so easy sometimes, but it's, you know, to be the church all together, everyone is protagonist, uh, we are called uh, ready to participate. But then the big challenge for today is how to put that into practice in all our parishes, dioceses, uh, theological faculties, communities, mm -hmm. lay movements, uh, Catholic charities. And that's what is the synod about, really with the aim to help the church to do the synodal conversion because it's an unfinished process. Right, and, and thank you for that. That puts all of us in this, which mm -hmm. is what the Spirit is asking us all to participate mm -hmm. in. And yet there's both hopes in there, right? And there are also um, fears. What are you sensing are, are the hopes that people have for this synodal journey? And wh what are you sensing are some of the fears that people have? Because it's, if we can name those, we can also attend to them. Yes, because um, it's truly, you know, a call to change and uh, it's a path of personal conversion and communal conversion. And everywhere in all the organizations, when you have a call to change, you have resistance and fears. And that's normal. That's very, very human. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in a way, we are nowadays in a kind of uh, phase of transition because we are almost 50 years and 50 years more after Vatican II, so trying to uh, continue the reception of Vatican II and to implement this ecclesiology of the people of God. But we have still more than 1,500 years <laughs> of experience and vision of the church, as I say, that. Uh, uh, with a more pyramidal uh, vision and the, the church as a perfect society in which the priests and the consecrated people are above the others. So nowadays, just to, to get rid also of a clerical church that has opened also abuses, as we have seen, and to move forward to a synodal church, it's like 
often I have in mind, you know, this image, this passage of the gospel, we are called to go to the other side of the lake, of the sea. And it's normal that in the middle, you know, it's, it's an unknown path in a way. And you can, um, synodality is about discernment in common, it's mm. listening to each other, it's a process of listening to listen to the Holy Spirit. And we know that in our life, if we really listen to the Holy Spirit, we need to be open, to have an open heart, to be open to the surprise of the Holy Spirit. So what is not easy and uh, can uh, raise fears is that, you know, synodality is an open path. It can be messy. At a time, it's also uh, um, to accept that you don't master everything. <laughs> Uh, if truly you are doing this journey uh, being led by the Holy Spirit. So we can hear all over the world that in many, many countries, you know, uh, lay people are very enthusiastic. And in some places, it's the first time they are asked to give their voice, <laughs> to contribute to uh, uh, what is the church, how the church has to uh, uh, live its mission. And um, in many countries also, we can see that uh, for some priests, it could be difficult because they feel it's also um, a call to have a new kind of leadership. It's not to get rid <laughs> of priesthood or the role of bishops. When you speak about synodality, it's a way to re-articulate, we can say, the sensus fidei fidelium, that means the sense of faith of all the faithful together who receive a kind of authority uh, to retrieve that and to articulate that with the collegiality of the bishops, the role of the bishops and the primacy of the Pope. So it's, um, it's a new way <laughs> uh, and it's not so easy for many priests and they told me that, you know, many, they have been trained to teach the people, <laughs> to teach uh, the truth of the gospel and the idea, and I could quote uh, just a few days ago, I had a conversation with some bishops and one of them was telling me that through this process, really listening to the people, and he has done listening session with immigrants, refugees, uh, women, shelters to welcome women who were alone. And, and he began to tell me, oh, you know, it is changing my way to look at evangelization. I really realize that before I teach, in fact, the Holy Spirit is already there through <laughs> the working <laughs> through the people. So it was very interesting and it, it was very moving to hear this bishop telling that, you know. So the, really the theological foundation for synodality is this conviction that the Holy Spirit is blowing everywhere and not just within the baptized, but also with people from other faiths or other denomination, including uh, through the, uh, the children. That's why also we ask to listen to the children. And um, there is also a great sense coming from the Bible that, you know, God is also speaking through and with the poor people. So it's also where are we, who are we listening? <laughs> Uh, and how we can also listen to those who have no voices. And my experience of the Synod on Youth, and then uh, especially also of the Synod on the Amazon as consultor, was that really this process has given a voice to the voiceless, to the indigenous people from Amazon. And so uh, we are really called, you know, to learn <laughs> how to listen better. But not just, it's not a psychological listening, or no, it's, it's because God is, uh, and it's Dei Verbum, you know, God is uh, coming to build a relationship with us, a friendship, and uh, we have to listen as God is coming to listen to us. And thank you for that, because it, it is reminding us that it will be a conversion process for everyone. Mm. So Pope Francis is opening himself to that. The bishops are being asked to do that. Clergy, uh, the whole people of God. Mm -hmm. And it will require listening spaces. And I too was just in a conversation a few weeks ago and it was a, a small group out of a, a group of 200 speaking about their experiences of synodality. 
And it was a woman who's been involved in Paris life for 30 years as well and said, this is the first time the church has ever asked me what I think. It's the first time. And I'm so happy to offer my thoughts, my reflections, my experience. And it's really reminding us of where some of the lacunae have been Mm. in this. Uh, You know, as you said, certain ministries that that are being reminded that the ministry must include the listening as well, and then also responding to it. So this is really going to change, you know, we're in a school of theology here. This will impact all of our theological disciplines. This is going to ask us, what does the incarnation mean? What does the spirit really mean? And what do we see here? It's going to ask us to say liturgically, How is a synodal way uh, being lived here? Will we find ourselves not just, you know, looking at the current ministries we have, but if we're really going to be creative, say, what, what else is the Spirit asking us to create? What other ways of service? What other ways of being? Uh, We're going to look at who's missing, who's missing. Catholic social teaching is always asking us about participation, the common good. Uh, where's our preferential option for the vulnerable? What, what does this mean? Synodality is one of our terms that asks to be lived out. And the environment, you mentioned that this is very much, synodality is going to link us to Laudato Si and how we walk with the earth in different ways. And, and so just that so much of this is happening at the same time is really key. And, and so how will we participate? And we have been as a church already been invited to say, how will we participate and what does that mean? And here we'd like to invite, uh, we have a little poll. So those of you who are here will get to raise your hands, but uh, we have just uh, you know a, a short question, uh, two questions here. On, on January 12th, when we met with Pro- Professor uh, Raphael Luciani, One of the questions was, you know, how many of you have participated in anything that's been a synodal process, right? So since January 12th, so from January 12th on, the question is, how many of you have participated in some process that you would say is is synodal? So it was literally said, we are going to have an experience of synodality. So those of you uh, online, are, if we could get the poll out, and those of you who are here, um, by a hand raised, how many of you have been in any conversations that are synodal? Okay, thank you. I, it takes longer for me to count than the computer. <laughs> So we had about 28, 29 people here. So probably like four fifths of the people. Do we have a response from, this feels like survey says, <laughs> um, something says. I don't know if I can see it if it's out. Because then you, while they're putting the numbers together, maybe I am faster than that computer. Uh, then the question, the second question is, if you said yes, which way? What was the means? Right? So do we have the first one yet? Not yet? Because the second one, now you can think about it. Uh, the second question is, if you said yes to this, that you were in some kind of synodal discussion or experience since January 12th, the, the follow-up question is, what, for how many of you was it in your parish or in a parish? All right, not a lot of people in this room. For how many of you, if you said yes, was it within an organization? So it might have been a school, like CTU has done something, or maybe the Religious Formation Conference, or another university was doing it, or you were part of LCWR, CMSWR, CMSM, you name it, or some other. So if you were part of some other group, 
Right? That's most of the people that had their hand up for there. And then the third question is, um, if you said yes, this is part C, um, for how many of you would it have been if you are in a religious congregation? Was it in your congregation? All right, it's a, it's a smaller number there. So, um, so what we found was of the people, I think Kathleen, I have this correct, the 78% of the people online have participated in some form of synodal experience. So 78%, that's, a, that's more than we had in January, which means that more things have shown up and more opportunities have shown up. And 22% no. Uh, and then I don't know if that second set of questions comes up, but we'll get to that. Um, it has come up and then we'll get the response to that. But it's simply to say, th this is simply a beginning, right? It's a beginning. So I know I, Kimberly Limore here, who runs our Tolton program, had a gathering I, that asked the question, where have all the black Catholics gone? Right? That was a synodal conversation, asking, where are we? What, what does this mean and, and where have we left? So to just see where these opportunities may be that, that are going on in our area. So I'm getting responses now. 18% of the people on, online have said that they're, they were involved in a synodal process in their parish, right? 18%. 46% said it was part of some organization that they were part of. So whether it was their school or, or some other group that they're in. And 59% said their congregation, that their religious congregation, they have been in that conversation. And some people, if you're adding those up and going, that's more than 100, you could answer yes to more than one. You could answer yes to more than one which actually is good news that you had more than one opportunity to engage in that. So, so thank you, thank you for that. And people are giving examples of places for that. And really, I know from my limited experience, actually, um, that places that have had it, and I'm gonna ask Sister Natalie, because she's got a much wider lens, places I know of have been, for example, universities in the Philadelphia area have had a process. Um, Ireland has a process that they are beginning nationally. Uh, Davenport, Iowa has, has a process they're calling three cups of coffee. And they're asking every parishioner to have three cups of coffee. So I probably would have more. But, but one cup of coffee with someone who's in your parish already. One cup of coffee with someone who you haven't seen since the pandemic and one cup of coffee with someone who's not part of the parish or who's left the church. So it could be any denomination, a any number of groups. Uh, some parishes are together having this. We spoke a few months ago to Sister Diana Cianjulu. Um, different groups are doing it. And at CTU here, we had every group have the opportunity to be involved in it. Uh, but. Natalie, you've, you've seen this on a much more global scale and it's not even done yet. Mm. So uh, in Media Race, what have you been noticing? Where have you seen synodal processes? Maybe just a few examples for us. Yes, maybe the first thing I want to share is that um, it's very moving for us because we are in contact with uh, you know all the world and uh, since I arrived in Rome in this uh, Secretariat for the Synod, we have done many Zooms with all the bishops' conferences in different languages, different time zones. Uh, so we have a lot of dialogue with, uh, and not only with the bishops' conferences, but also the Union of Superior Generals, the um, different movements like Caritas International, uh, Laudato Si Movement, and all that kind of organization. Uh, at an international level and also in the local churches. And it's wonderful to see how, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is really blowing with a lot of creativity. 
And I invite you to go and see our website. Uh, we have the official website with the official documents, synod.va, but we have also um, um, open a website called Sharing Resources for the Synod where every group uh, can share, you know, materials, uh, uh, images, contributions, and it's wonderful to see everything that is happening, uh, initiatives. So I can just give you some kind of different uh, examples. So um, last week I, I, wo I uh, was on Zoom with a big conference in India organized in a theological faculty with 500 theologians for the first time. There were also many lay theologians, sisters, and on synodality for three days. And um, because now it's an important topic, uh, uh, and many, many theological faculties are all around the world are publishing and, and doing things. But what, why I, I uh, give this example? Because it's also one of the key issues is uh, how to think about synodality through and with the different cultures. So in Africa, they have also organized a theological uh, uh, reflection with many different kind of theologians on how to think about synodality from an African perspective. Uh, so there are many initiatives in, uh, among theologians, but then for listening session, you know, you have also, uh, uh, I have received a, a very moving and wonderful report from it was three sisters in a, one of the biggest refugee camp in Africa. It's in Kenya. And the Jesuit refugee service is there also. It's a big, big camp. And the sisters uh, have begun to adapt and to think how to do the synodal process with the refugees, including Muslims. Uh, and uh, they have organized listening session, but uh, uh, and to really listen to the to the uh, to the people in Spain, uh, they have decided to do the synodal process um, with the prisoners in all the prisons through the ch uh, with the chaplains, and uh, they have also prepared some kind of uh, uh, questionnaires and, and listening session in a special way for the those who are incarcerated. Um, in Malaysia, m the Catholic Church is a very small church, uh, you know, the Catholic uh, are small minorities among mainly Buddhists, and most of the Catholic are married with Buddhists. So when the, the diocese, the bishop has opened the synod and launched the process, the, the husbands or the <laughs> wives uh, who are Buddhists said, we, we would like also to be part of the, uh, of the synod. And in many countries, I'm thinking also about Algeria, you know, the Catholic Church is also very small, and they are doing everything they are doing is with also Muslims. And so for them, it's completely natural uh, to do the synodal process also with, um, with Muslim. And we can say, that the, you know, it's the same spirit, the spirit of interreligious dialogue in a way, and the spirit of synodality. It's a spirit of encounter, um, uh, mutual listening, mutual understanding. So uh, we have different, uh, you know, initiative like that. Uh, and it's really a call f to be creative. <laughs> Uh, and to think about how to engage people uh, through different um, through different ways, uh, according to the local reality, mm -hmm. you know, because in fact the methodology of synodality is um, uh, we can say a kind of inductive methodology. The starting point is the reality, our situation. It's the mm -hmm. discerning of the sign of the times in a way that was the methodology of the Council, uh, Second Vatican Council, especially with Gaudium et Space. You look at the situation, you face the reality, the starting mm -hmm. point is not an idealistic vision of the church, but it's where we are now. <laughs> and you have to discern the sign of the times, looking at the reality, at the situations. So it's the methodology is a kind of um, adaptation, but uh, of what we, the methodology of Catholic action, see, judge, act. 
It's looking at the situation, listening, uh, seeing what is happening, then interpreting uh, with the, um, the light of the gospel, and uh, to discern and to choose the path uh, to take. Mm -hmm. And it's very simple, the, you know, we have m one main question for this synodal consultation, even if after we have 10 topics. But the main question is, how are we already doing our journey together? So it's a call to reread our experience of synodality, because m in most of our <coughs> church places, we, we don't begin from nothing. <laughs> we are already uh, journeying together. But then it's how the Holy Spirit is calling us to move forward. So through our already experience of church, what is good, where the Holy Spirit is um, bearing fruits, <laughs> but also what are the difficulties. So it's also talking about uh, difficult issues, <laughs> Uh, how do we leave the governance, the participation, what is the place of the women, of the young people. Uh, so we have to be open to that and um, listening to each other, we will discern the way to move forward. And, and thank you for that because you're right, it will be the sharing of our lives from the realities. Mm -hmm. And when we look at simply the simply the United States reality, and we're not alone in this, you kept bringing up the word dialogue. Mm. And we're struggling. We're, we're a church that's quite polarized. We're a nation that's quite polarized. And there's something being asked of us here in terms of this process that will name our wounds, but can also offer some spaces forward. And it will ask us, to learn how to really listen to one another again, and particularly to listen to those with whom I th may disagree and think differently. And so how we will do that in a way that can be fruitful, right? Not more violence, but in a way that can find a, a, another movement forward. And we're both hearing people saying in ministry, I don't know how to do that. I, we're going to have to teach ourselves, learn together, not with someone who says, I have all the ways, because as you said, cultures are different and different ways of being heard and listened to and in different realities. But it will be because we get people who, you know, join us from around the world thinking about what your reality is and what really needs to be attended to. And certainly, probably globally, dialogue is one of the areas that we're being called to, uh, the kind of dialogue that has receptivity on both sides and can really move forward for the reign of God, for God's people and God's creation. So what we'd like to invite you to, because this isn't limited to church uh, broadly, but we're going to find that in all areas of the, of the church community is a question for a minute of silence and then some input from the, all of you who are online and those of you who are here, the conversation with one another. The question is, where do you long to have a deeper synodal process like, and, and a listening and reception space? But I'm asking, where are you willing and longing to be open and present? Where are you longing? Where are you sensing the real need? And you would be willing to have yourself open and present to the other. Right. So where's the space you're longing for a mutual dialogue? With whom? And now we invite you for two minutes to just speak with, if you're here, to speak to one person uh, that you're next to. And those of you who are online, if you would just share, where, where would you be willing to have a, a real dialogue, a mutual receptive dialogue? Thank you. I welcome you back, and what we're hearing, just even online, are, are 
you know, where are the spaces you're willing to be open to listening and engaging have ranged from the bishop of my diocese and the staff to my own province in my congregation to parish ministry to partners in mission to the traditionalist Catholics in my faith community to young adults to indigenous peoples uh, to the persons on the margins who do not feel heard, I'm, I'm willing. Uh, to family members that I'm on different political and ecclesial lines with. So, so there's a longing here. And now we're going to move it to the third part because I think all of us bring all those pieces to our ways of life, our, our own calls, whether uh, we're single, married, or in religious life. Let's move it a little bit more now to particularly in, in religious life and the role of religious, what we have to offer, but also what we have to learn. And so, Natalie, how and where might you see this process of synodality as both a growing edge for religious life, but also a space where there's something religious have to offer the wider church? Yes, in a way we can say that religious life has synodality as a DNA <laughs> uh, because uh, through our experience of community life, of uh, uh, prayer life and discernment in common, uh, the experience of uh, the chapters and so, uh, so I feel and with many others that at this time of the church where you know it's clear that the church is called to this uh, synodal conversion to a kind of synodalization of all <laughs> the places in the church religious life has a lot to give to share um, this experience of uh, synodality but in the same time i s i feel that uh, there is no community that has completely finished also our synodal conversion so we are called to share already our experience and i can share with you uh, two very interesting um, moment i have been uh, attended in uh, at the beginning of july with uh, to launch our commission on spirituality we have organized a study day with uh, delegates well, representatives from the different uh, spiritual families so to listen to them how are you really doing discernment in common in your uh, spiritual tradition so we had uh, the abbot primate of the benedictine to tell us about the, the experience of uh, synodality and discernment in common through the benedictine tradition we had uh, the Dominican order presented also the experience of the Dominican, the Franciscan, the Augustinian, uh, the Salesian, the Ignatian, and we have also asked two new lay movements, Sant'Egidio and Focolare, also to share well, in very also practical way, how are you doing this sermon in common and um, what is your experience of synodality? And that was, we have done that through a kind also of synodal process with uh, a style of discernment. So after all the inputs, we had workshops, really to also look at what are the features for spirituality of synodality among all our spirituality. But it was so rich to listen to the different experience because the way to discern or to do uh, synodality, for instance, for Dominican uh, communities or order is not exactly the same as for the, for the Franciscan or the Ignatian. And last weekend, I was in Budapest in Hungary for also a study day organized by a, a theological faculty that is a little bit like CTU, uh, founded by religious order. It's called the Sapientia in um, so for many different religious and also lay people. And uh, they were better than us in Rome because there was, they have also asked a bishop to tell uh, us to share his experience, how he's really doing synodality and uh, through the different council and not only the synodal process, but uh, and also a lay woman. And that was very, very interesting. But uh, they, we also, I got the experience of the, the, the Benedictine abbot who was there, the prioress of the Dominican, so there were also the different uh, family. 
And I feel that kind of thing we need to continue really to share. And because a synodal church is not only a listening church, it's a learning church. It's a church in which each of us, we have something to give and something to learn. And Pope Francis is saying that also in this key speech I told you about. Uh, a synodal church is a, uh, a church in which each of us, the Pope, the bishops, the lay people, we have some, something to learn. And I really feel also that, you know, the vision of a synodal church is a church of local churches. Mm -hmm. And in each culture, we have a way to live, um, to be Christians, a way to live the church that is also linked to our culture. So the, 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 each culture has something to give to the others, but also a path of conversion to do. And um, so where we can also within religious life, not only be part of the synodal process, and the first call is to contribute at the parish level, at the diocesan level, because it's very important to, uh, we are part of the people of God. <laughs> we are not uh, separate from all the people of God. So we have to, to contribute there. But we can do also the synodal process through our own community to reflect on our way uh, to do synodality. But I also think, and places like here are good places also to share in a more concrete way and to support each other on uh, discerning how to move forward. And I think also that because as religious, we are called, you know, to be a prophetic uh, presence in the world, to be involved in ministry. The a key challenge is also how to, have to really implement synodal ministry. Through the Synod on Young People, we have really understood that young people want to be listened to, they want to be protagonists. The paradigm for doing youth ministry is the image of the road of Emmaus, what mm. Jesus Christ is doing. It, 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 not, it doesn't begin to teach. It begins to come where they are, to walk with them, to listen to their pain, to their wants, to their... Uh, uh, hopes and disillusions, and then he, after this listening, he, he explains them the scripture, he stay with them. So Jesus is a, uh, at Emmaus is a kind of model for us to have a synodal ministry. And uh, one of the output was, it's written in uh, Christus Vivid chapter 7, youth ministry has to be synodal. But today, it's not only youth ministry, it's all kind of ministry. And one of the key challenge for me is really to have a synodal ministry or a synodal style to be the church. We have to foster teamwork, collaborative leadership, to be a, a servant leadership. And as religious, we really need to be, uh, I think, at the front line <laughs> also of that. Uh, and to also continue to have very in mind how do we train our new members and on ongoing formation, how we train people for this teamwork, for this collaborative leadership, that is a servant leadership, to train people really to learn to work together, to work together. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's a Pascal journey. <laughs> I experience that every day. It's not easy. But we know that it is the communion that is missionary. <laughs> and uh, in a synodal church, nobody should minister alone or nobody should decide alone. That doesn't mean that you don't have someone who at the end is the, <laughs> the president, the leader. Or, but um, it's one thing is to decide alone without any consultation. Another thing is to decide, you know, through a discernment process that will reach uh, a synodal process if it works well. In fact, it reaches a consensus. So it's also how do we relearn a culture of consensus? And that's a big challenge, and you, you mm -hmm. raise it, especially in, in this country, but also in other countries. Now we are more used to fight against each other than trying to, to build a consensus. No, and, and thank you for that, because it, it's so true. You're inviting us to really look at our vow of obedience, right? What does that mean? 
And how will the synodal process invite nuances, invite ways of engagement? So it'll ask persons in servant leadership positions to say, how do we and what would that look like I ever more deeply in the way the Spirit might be inviting? It'll ask those of us who are in formation accompaniment and ministry, what does that mean? What is the formation process like? But also it'll ask those of us who've been in religious life for a while, how are we being called at this point? Because every level is being asked and including in our ministry. So to, to not have just one person run something, but uh, a committee that, mm -hmm. that will invite creativity on our part. And it'll also in our parishes, in our schools say, well, how do we finance that, right? So if we really want it, we will have to figure out what does that mean and, and how do we re-envision so much because we see that there's so much richness in bringing more people together. So that's a, a very powerful piece. For women religious, it will also mean, and, and there's a Paschal element to it, of, you know, where are we invited? And if we're not invited in some places, how do we invite others to a conversation? Uh, you know, persons who are often on the margins, whether it's of religious life or, or society, how do we create new spaces for this? And, and what will that mean? What does that ask? It's really interesting, and, and we do want to say if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll try to get to at least some of them. And those of you who are here, those pens and pieces of paper are waiting for you. And we have um, two folks standing up right now who are willing to grab, uh, to take your questions, and one or two people who are willing to uh, take your questions and bring them to us. But you know, the, we received a number of questions and thank you for that. And we've tried to weave them into this conversation. But one of the questions that's come throughout has been literally uh, from sisters who would see and brothers and religious priests, all of them in different ways were self-identifying and saying, you know, I'm a newer member. How, what's our call in this? or I'm a younger person, whatever you want to name for younger, uh, and other people saying, you know what, I'm not in active ministry, but I want to be part of the synodal process. What's my role in this, right? And then you have folks in the middle who fit into all kinds of uh, categories or not. So everyone's asking that question. I'm sure it's not only in religious life, but here we're thinking about it in religious life saying, you know, what's what's our call in this and also how does our voice get heard to be part of that discernment to be part of that discernment process who how do we listen to our we've spent you know had a couple of years engaging in ctu and and it's only the beginnings on interculturality right and there's a real connection between synodality the, the, the depth that's needed for synodality and the depth that's needed to really be intercultural communities. And we've spoken about, you know, the, the um, racism in religious life, in our church, uh, in our U.S. society. Uh, we're looking at the, today, the Canadian um, indigenous, the per indigenous persons from coming from Canada and meeting with the Pope. So we have so many places that are, and peoples, that we have the earth as well, crying out um, and saying, I have cries too, and I have something to offer as well. Uh, and, and Natalie, they're, they're asking, how do I, how do I contribute those? How do I offer that in religious life? And, and what does that mean? And those of you who have questions, please give them to our, raise your hand so people can uh, bring them over. And then if you have questions, those of you here um, and the online community, um, we'll try to listen to those as well. But how, how does everyone, the newest members, the, the younger, the middler, the, the folks who've been in a good long time, what's the call? I think the, the first thing is really to realize that all of us uh, are called, as I said, to be protagonists and to be promoters of synodality. We each have a role to play. It, it's not enough to say, it, it's not only the duty or synodality won't uh, happen uh, only 
but with some bishops or some priests. No, we each have a role to play. And one of the biggest challenge also is really to empower the lay people, all the batailles, the youngest, to discover that they are called to be protagonists. No one is a mere extra, as uh, Pope Francis said. We are called to be all the church together. And especially, as I said, and that's a strong focus for this synodal process, ready to reach out and to give voice, to listen to those who have no voices. And I think religious life has a very strong call uh, to reach out and to bring these voices uh, of those who are not listened to or uh, who are from the peripheries also through the synodal process. Not only for the synodal process, but if we really listen to those on the margins, in fact, it helps us, you know, really to be, that's a way to be sure that you listen to everybody. If you are able to listen to those who are more on the margins and, and they help us to, uh, you know, it, it's true that the gospel is first announced to, uh, to the poor and they, they, they help us really to be focused on the, um, on the gospel. So I think that uh, all of us, uh, whatever our age, our condition, <laughs> our position, we really have a role to play, not alone. So it's also how we uh, build network, we are creative with others, we discern. And I think what is very important also for religious life, because when we speak about the synodal church, it's a church also really that value, recognize, uh, the charisms and uh, so each congregation also according to her own uh, charism has to discern a place it's not the same for everyone um, so as a religious order and also each one of us uh, it's uh, according to the charism we have received to uh, to serve the common good so it's it's also a matter of discernment i i, I would say but it's very important to be, <laughs> because you know the key word, as I said, for synodality is co-responsibility. Uh, so we are all co-responsible uh, if really we realize that, uh, uh, and, and how do we speak about the church? Because even in religious life, so many times we speak about the bishops of the priests as if they are uh, another group <laughs> and and we are not the church no <laughs> you know we 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 are all together and and i think we need to to help to to build bridges among generations among people from different culture and also among people from different vocations and uh, so a spirituality of synodality is truly uh, based on uh, listening, encountering, and discerning, but it's a spirituality of reconciliation. And we have to really not to give up, because if we really think that, as I say, synodality is the call of God for the church of the third millennium, that is the way to be church, uh, the same church, but in, in this changing world, then we can be confident that the Holy Spirit will uh, help us to find the ways, even if sometimes we don't see <laughs> clearly. But um, so I hope and I encourage each of you here and online ready to, to continue to be creative. And it's not a matter of deadline, you know, because of course uh, the diocesan phase, there will be the synthesis to be finished, to be sent then to the bishops conference or, or to for the religious communities to USG but or USG but um, it's it's not a matter of that line the the aim of the synod is is not about drafting documents even if they could be useful and you will do that but it's about really um, dreaming and discerning uh, and continuing the journey because the vision of synodality is about a dynamic vision of the church. So it's being always on the road <laughs> and, and continuing the journey. So one of the questions then about this is um, if 
if we will really be listening at our local churches and our local congregations in, in the regional places as well, um, things may really move. So sometimes the question becomes, so the local church, m one local church may have a very different direction than another local mm -hmm. church. So you may find groups saying, well, we're really feeling called to listen to, you know, the voice of the Spirit that seems very loud here in, in on this topic or on this area. So it might be new ways of doing ministry in, in one country or a different set of inclusions in, in another. Uh, do you sense, uh, because it's in a lot of the questions, including the, the private chats that are coming in here, Will the local churches, if, if the whole local church has a discernment process, will they be able to act on what's calling them? Or is it going to have to go through then, this goes from the local church to the continental to the synod of bishops, and then there'll be approval processes. It, is it going to be a dynamic process where we'll be able to do some odd experimentum, and that certainly would be in religious life as well, to try this way of journeying together. Do you sense that? Yes, what I see and I think also is that, you know, we are trying to relearn to be ready a global church through and with diversity. <laughs> Uh, we are coming from a model of unity and communion that was rather through a vision of a kind of uniformity. And, mm -hmm. and now, uh, and Pope Francis has stated that, uh, and maybe you have read uh, just one week ago on the Feast of St. Joseph, the new constitution for the Roman Curia was published with two key words to really uh, understand it and uh, uh, to draft this, <laughs> this uh, con new constitution, it's synodality and mission. And um, it's also a new way for the center, we can say <laughs> at the Vatican, to envision uh, the Roman Curia not only at the service of the Pope, you know, but at the service of the bishop's conference of the local churches and to foster a dialogue. And Pope Francis' way is truly, since Evangelii Gaudium, uh, is stating that probably we need to reinforce or to think better about the authority also of the bishop's conference in this synodal process for the first time after the diocesan phase, national phase to gather all the synthesis we will have in between January uh, and January 23 and March 23, we will have seven continental meetings. <laughs> so for Africa, Latin America, North America, Middle East, Europe, uh, Asia, Oceania, that will be a way to bring the voices from the different uh, cultural areas. And I feel that we are you know, is this process, it's not easy because we are coming from a, a kind of uh, vision uh, of the church uh, with this vision of unity and this uh, specific way to relate be between the center and the, and the local churches. But now the, the vision is more, uh, and it's clear through, through this process, as I said, that the church is a church of local churches. It's the vision of synodality is an incarnated vision. <laughs> it's not, um, and we are trying to learn what should we have really in common, but also how we can foster a kind of diversity that in fact we already have. <laughs> but sometimes we, we have forgotten that. From the beginning, we had four gospels that was trying to tell the same story, <laughs> uh, but uh, coming from different communities, the, the Greeks, the Jews. In our Catholic Church, uh, we have also the Oriental churches, uh, Maronite, Greek Catholic, you know, uh, and they have uh, uh, different uh, ways of uh, doing the um, liturgy. Uh, uh, as I said, I was in Hungary last uh, weekend in, with the Greek Catholic Church also, almost all the priests are married. After Vatican II, uh, when the diaconate was uh, reinstituted, you know, it was 
uh, um, so the, the possibility was opened by the council, but then it, it, it was led to be the choice of the bishop conference or dioceses. And you have countries like here where you have deacons and other countries where you don't have deacons. It's not a problem. <laughs> there is already that kind of diversity. So we, we can imagine, and I think that maybe the synod will help also, uh, and with the synod on the Amazon, uh, the, it has also fostered um, specific ways to be the church uh, in in a, in a region according to the to the situation, but it's not written in advance, you know. <laughs> and truly, the synodal process is a learning process. It's a learning by doing, and I feel we are trying to relearn to be a synodal church. Mm. So it's also sometimes you you can make mistakes, <laughs> maybe, but uh, it, it's step by step. And uh, that's why we really need to, you know, uh, and, and ready to do okay. the synodal process. It, it's about being able to, it, it's true that you can uh, have your own conviction or ideas, but as Pope Francis also explains, through experience of discernment in common, you know, sometimes when you have some, some kind of polarities, different views, but at the time, the work of the Holy Spirit will open new paths you never imagined before. So I really feel, including uh, about the question of ministry, that maybe uh, there will be new ministry we don't really think uh, now. Mm -hmm. But the, the true question is, to be um, this missionary church to serve better the world of today, how do we think the ministerial organization of the church? Uh, that's a true question, in fact. Right, and, and those questions are coming up in, in a variety of places. What you're saying, Natalie, is that Pope Francis is asking for every voice to be heard. So. Um, every race, every culture, every creed, every orientation, gender, so every, the whole people of God. And finding ways, I mean, nature is certainly crying out in pain all, all around us. So, so that that really is a, a space that people can come home to and, and say, what will this mean? And some of the questions here are both uh, acknowledging what you've just said about this process will require a letting go. Mm. Um, a, the language in my tradition we talk about is uh, disponibilidad, a radical availability to what the spirit is trying to ask of us mm. and, and being open to it. And, and it will mean for religious to say, where are the spaces we need to hold and for whom and how do we welcome uh, all people and to, to listen? So. The whole church is to do that, but we certainly have a role in that. And what you're actually inviting us to is, you know, one of the words, uh, communion, participation, and mission, right, for synodality, is communion that's going to be deeper, mm. perhaps, than what we know of at this moment. So I've been thinking about that word. We talk about our partners in mission or co-members or associates or whatever the language is for the people with whom and we minister and and you know engage with in boards or schools or other ministries something new is being asked of us in this and it is to say what does communion really mean it doesn't mean we lose the the what is each group's to do but we will be listening differently. So it's not just partnering or even collaborating may, may no longer be sufficient. We may have to say, what would communion really look like, right? And, and that isn't just make, you know, 10 people be one, 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 but, but to say, but it's you, it's you, it's you, and these are the gifts. So something is being asked in, in religious, actually, in the way we have our governance and organizations can actually play with that, can actually say, how are we as Sisters of Mercy being asked 
to be mercy in a synodal way? Um, how are we as Sacred Heart, Sisters of St. Joseph? How are we as Franciscan men? How are we as Sacred Heart men? How are we being asked as Passionists? What, what does this mean for us in this? And, and it's, uh, it's going to be very powerful to see um, as religious, as we take this on, and because you did say, you know, get involved in, in your local places, mm -hmm. uh, but also, you know, religious life has been one of the spots where we've been able to try the new. We've early on, people will tell the stories of reading the documents of Vatican II and trying to make them live. And, and so we're in another moment, and, and you spoke very powerfully about this is a significant moment when everyone is being asked for their discerning offerings and for all of us to find new ways to be church together that is still church. There's, there's a lot here, and it's why like, even the gatherings we have um, are with religious, but we've also been saying it's the why church. How do we work together in new ways? What's being asked of this moment? Um, how can we be creative? Because all of these questions I'm getting in, in here are saying, you know, how do we discern? And, and we, we may have to learn new ways of discerning as well. So you brought up the, our religious families have ways, but you may have to ask everyone, how does your parish discern? And can, can different spiritualities offer something in this? So, you know, looking at that, I, I'm wondering, because we could, we'll have part two with uh, Global Sisters Report a few days from now, but, you know, if you were to offer us, you know, um, some, some way that if we said, how can we more deeply participate? Like, what would you ask of us uh, here who are students, who are faculty, um, who are in religious life, who are single, who are married, um, and, and in all modes of, of work and ministry, um, how would you call us forth? at this moment, maybe some last words. Yes, maybe the last word I would like to share with you uh, an expression of uh, Cardinal Gregg with whom I'm working at the, at the Secretary of the Synod, he's the General Secretary, um, he's a priest from Gozo, a diocese in Malta, and the other Under Secretary, uh, Bishop Louis uh, Marine de Saint Martin, is an Augustinian uh, religious. But uh, last week and the week af before, we had a Zoom meeting with all the synodal reference of religious communities. And Cardinal Greg told them, you know, I feel you are already an icon of synodality. And at the end, he said, maybe also religious life is a parable of synodality. So um, why I say that? Because I feel also that our, and, and you know, the the vision of synodality is truly rooted in the mystery of the Trinity. So it's also about retrieving the role, as I said, of the Holy Spirit with a more also pneumatical approach. But at the end, it's how, as a religious community, we are called to reflect <laughs> the Trinity in a way through our uh, com community life and. Uh, and um, truly, we are called and we are rooted into prayer. And this process is really calling everybody, all the people of God, you know, to live the process as a spiritual process that is first um, a listening of the word of God <laughs> and that is really rooted into prayer. So I feel, and, and I, I would like to call religious life first to pray for the synod and also to contribute uh, in every places, parishes, uh, different listening sessions or through the process to help, you know, um, and, and to, to recall that it's a prayerful process. The methodology for the synodal process is what we call a kind of spiritual conversation. It's not a debate just to, to speak and the other, no. It, it's through a listening process, including silence, prayer. It begins with uh, in the prayer to invoke the Holy Spirit, to listen to the word of God. And so as religious, I really feel that we have a, 
this part also to play and to, to train people uh, to be trained, but also to help the others to, uh, to discover what is discernment, personal discernment and communal discernment, because it's not enough to talk about it. it it's truly about the life of the spirit. Uh, and um, you experience it and you discover it through experience. So that's why th our first task as religious is you really, you know, to journey with the people <laughs> like uh, Jesus Christ at Emmaus and to help them to discover where the spirit is there and, uh, and to provide concrete experiences to open spaces, <laughs> you know, with different kind of people. It's, it, because that's the most important. It's really to provide a, a large number of people that kind of experience that we have received or experience also through religious life. Of course, in different ways, no, not everybody's called to, to have a, the same kind of life. But uh, I feel, and, and, and I have listened to very interesting experience of communities, you know, doing that with others. Uh, so um, we have a lot to do and we have also a lot to receive <laughs> because uh, you know synodality is spreading by capillarity mm. so the, the key words for synodality and I would let that is reciprocity and circularity so how also as religious we are in this reciprocity with lay people with priest with uh, different kind of people and how we we receive and we give mm. thank you thank you for that and you're inviting us to be discerning people Christus Vivid I remember kept saying teach discernment and mm. maybe we all need to learn ever more how to be discerning people in in a synodal key and in this moment with what's asked of us and so um, Perhaps the invitation, as I am about to just say thank you to all of you, is to have some conversations, to, to risk the conversation uh, that, that will stretch my heart, our hearts, uh, wherever we are, and, and to risk being in those where we can offer some of ourselves. In, in this time and because so much of conversation with Natalie was when people have experiences something shifts and we know that that's our experience of God when we have these experiences something shifts and so how might we be about this and it is a spirit time this is the time of the spirit and we thank you all for taking time um, to engage this conversation and to thoughtfully pray with this then and to say what's calling me next and so those of you who are here in person I uh, thank you for for being here those of you who are online thank you so much for being part of this um, we're all asking of you please be involved create if it's not there uh, create it and if it's there also participate in different ways and 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 let us find how the spirit is far more creative than even our most creative senses. So we'll be doing this together. And I want to thank all the people who've made this possible um, this evening. So our sponsoring congregations, thank you so much. Um, all the folks at CTU, Tim Frakes for all the videography, your skills and, and your team. Uh, Colleen Kennedy, who's pulled so much together, uh, our friends who run the, the Zoom community, Sister Barbara for uh, in welcoming us. Um, Sister Natalie, thank you. Thank you for living your vocation as the Spirit's inviting you to serve the church and the world. Um, you always have a home here at CTU. Uh, whether it's uh, spring, summer, winter, or fall, in the same day sometimes, we can give you all of these. Uh, and, and know that if there's any way we can be of service, um, let us know, let us know. Because religious life and all of us gathered here want to and, and have this as part of our own commitment. So, so thank you so much. 
Uh, give Pope Francis a hug if you can <laughs> for us uh, in every language imaginable uh, and, and know that we're so grateful to you. So, so thank you one and all for being here. Uh, it's, it's a gift to gather. Those of you who are here want to say hello to Sister Natalie yourselves, please come and do so. And uh, we'll have this, this is recorded. It'll come out as soon as uh, we can get the editing completed, and you'll have an email with the link to it, and it'll be at learn at ctu.edu. If you missed our January event, that was January 12th, and that is already on learn at ctu.edu, and there's a lot of other wonderful resources. So uh, th thank you, one and all, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.